is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 156 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Arsa Maria Bradley all about collaborations. Now, I know this is a topic we've covered before, but uh, she had a really interesting take on collaborations and has done absolutely loads of them uh, and comes at it from kind of a learning perspective. And I really liked this and I really enjoyed the conversation. So uh, more on that shortly. But first to last week's question, which was, what's the best thriller you've ever read? Ian Worrell said, I would like to say mine, but I'm not sure that's permitted. (laughs) Ha, joking. Uh, So I will say too many good ones to name the best ever. So I will put down, uh, I will put two down that some might not have heard of. Rasputin's Shadow by Raymond Cowery uh, and the Romanov uh, Prophecy by Steve Berry. Ooh, the Romanov prophecy. I like the sound of that. Okay, so Edwin Downward said, I've never been a big fan of thrillers. Too fast-paced for me. The only ones that come to mind uh, are quite dated. Ice Station Zebra, The Road to Dusty Death, and Congo. I love that. A.E. Kincaid said, And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. Oh, classic. And then Lottie Sarko said, uh, Someone has to mention the the book talk and you book tube favourites, right? The best thrillers I've ever read, I found through social media. Uh, Verity by Colleen Hoover. Can I just, I actually love Colleen Hoover. So I've read a, a, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I've read one or two of her books. But anyway, um, I love how much charity work she does. Uh, She's fantastic. She was, if you guys haven't heard of her, she was an indie author and now has dual contracts. I think she's hybrid. Um, But she does these like devour in one sitting type books. Uh, I read one of her books. uh, It ends with us a few years ago. And the sequel, it starts with us, which is a juxtaposition. (laughs) Anyway, uh, that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, But uh, I read that book and I literally devoured it in one sitting. And she just reads these really consumable, um, can't put down type books. So it's a fantastic one to deconstruct. Uh, And if you are interested in deconstructing to find out what she's done, of course, you could read my book, The Anatomy of a Bestseller, which is all about book deconstruction. Anyway, (laughs) picture side. Right. Uh, Lottie also says The One by John Mars. Lock Every Door by Riley Sager. Oh, my friend uh, Kate loves Riley Sager. Uh, And A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, a series by Holly Jackson. I love the bookish online community for their recommendations. As do I, as do I. Okay, so this week's uh, question is, would you ever collaborate? And if so, in what way? There is no book recommendation of the week this week. I've been reading... um, (laughs) I've been reading books... (laughs) Oh, gosh. I have been reading books, but I don't want to recommend any of them for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, Not that they were good or bad. I just don't feel they're appropriate for this podcast. Uh, However, I actually would like a recommendation from you. I'm looking for nonfiction. I'm looking for it to be inspiring, motivational. I'm looking for it to be uh, sort of in the self-help business, marketing mindset uh, arena. So any one of those topics, uh, it can be it can be it can be about writing it can be about business or or success in general not looking for autobiographies i don't really enjoy autobiographies or biographies uh more sort of uh information based but yes if anyone has any recommendations please do let me know on instagram preferably uh, and i am at sasha black author but i'm dying for a bit of really good uh you know inspiring motivational knowledgeable type uh, non-fiction as i seem to be lacking in the non-fiction this year i've read more fiction i think than, than non-fiction so i'm craving a bit of non-fiction okay the rebel of the week oh no wait no 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 <laughs> Skipping over my update. (laughs) That's because I don't want to give my update. (laughs) Oh, this last week, the weeks since I have been back from Africa have been savage. Uh, This week in particular, I am absolutely exhausted. I literally um, can't explain to you how tired I am at the moment. I don't really know what that's about. I don't know if it's that we've now started the school term. We're in week two of the school term or or what, but I'm feeling very, very tired. Um, I don't feel burned out particularly. Uh, creatively, I'm fine. I'm just really tired. 
<laughs> uh, perhaps it's because my brain is starting to want to hibernate for winter. I don't know. Uh, well, although obviously it's only winter in the northern hemisphere. Um, but uh, what have I been doing? So basically, I've been f- trying to catch up with uh, tasks that I owe people, presentations, all of that kind of stuff. I have started my next book which is under a pen name, a secret pen name, as you guys know. Um, and to my delight and surprise, I although I haven't had an awful lot of time to work on it, I am still out uh, outpouring words at the same pace that I was pouring them out before, which gives me hope that I can finish this book off nice and quickly, although it may, may need a good solid edit. Uh, but it, it is giving me hope that I can write this book quickly. Um, and uh, then I will be on to nonfiction. And I have decided the nonfiction, I think I told you guys that before. Um, it, I am excited, so excited. I'm like literally buzzing. I can't wait to tell you guys about what this nonfiction book is going to be. Uh, and I have a feeling that you're all going to love it. It is not uh, the book on tropes. I know I mentioned tropes. I still think I will do that, but it's not that book. We are, we are, oh, I can't tell you. Okay, no, not, not yet. I need to have started working on it before I can tell you. But I'm, I'm sorry. I know this is really dickish, but um, I am genuinely super buzzed and excited to talk to you guys all about this topic. Um, so I, I will give you more on that once I get to the end of this uh, fiction book. Um, and so uh, I know I am delayed on the audiobook. It's very frustrating because the audiobook is really uh, not very far away from completion. Uh, this is the audiobook for Anatomy of a Bestseller, but um, I've had so many things and commitments that I had previously committed to to do for other people that um, I, I have had to prioritise that and I've not been able to get to the audiobook. However, I am hoping that today uh, I can mop everything up that I owe and then um, from tomorrow I will be uh, purely word vomiting and finishing the audiobook. So that that should... Fingers crossed, <laughs> fingers crossed. I should still be able to get the audiobook done uh, this month, which is which is my goal. So I think that's it really. Uh, for for the next week, I am going to be yeah writing and doing the audiobook once I finish up all the admin today. And then in terms of other things, I wanted you guys, I wanted to let you guys know about the next Rebel Readers Masterclass. So the next class is on conflict and tension, how to create conflict and tension. We're going to be reading two books, The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton, which is also called The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle, if you are in the States. I'm not sure if that's the title in other countries, but those are the two versions of it that I'm aware of. And then the other one is The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. And this class is going to run in November. You do need to be a uh, a patron. And uh, the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to watch Top Gun Maverick as a class, uh, as as a Patreon community, the movie night which will go towards the class. I will deconstruct it afterwards. Uh, We are going to watch it, though, all together as a big sort of fun community night uh, with popcorn and chitter-chatter in the text chat, not over the movie, of course, because then you get popcorn thrown at you. Uh, But so, yes, if you would like to join us, then hop over to Patreon. Um, And, uh, yeah, so uh, I'll tell you about Patreon in a bit. All right, Rebel of the Week is Laura Stiles. So Laura says... I can't pretend to be much of a rebel, but 20 odd years ago, I managed to talk my way around country visa laws. Oh my goodness me. Uh, My husband was from Syria and after we had been married for 11 months, he returned to Syria to see his family for a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, his mother was ill and he had to extend his visit, which meant missing out on our first anniversary. Oh no. Hell no, I thought. To get a visa to Syria used to take a month uh, as they do intensive security checks, but I had less than a week. I phoned the Syrian embassy and managed to (laughs) to black my way into talking to the ambassador. I spun him a sob story and and he told me to drop my passport at the embassy and he would see what he could do. I was working, but in my lunch hour, I travelled across London to drop off my passport. The visa uh, office was closed, so I had to knock on the front door of the embassy. I was told to come back the next day. The following day, I again rushed to the embassy in my lunch hour, once again knocking on the front door, where I was given my uh, given back my passport <gasps> with the addition of a visa stamp. I then booked my flight, told uh, told work I was off on holiday, and headed off to surprise my husband. I even got fast track through security and passport control when I got there. My husband is never lost for words, but when I turned up in Syria on our anniversary, he looked like a goldfish (laughs) for 
at least 10 minutes unable to talk. Since then, I have the view that rules are there for other people to follow. Oh my goodness me, I absolutely love that. And I love that it was a romantic rebellion as well. You guys know that I love a bit of romance. Oh, I do love this so much. Oh, thank you so much. And if you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. I know I say this a lot, but seriously, guys, like we are always in need of rebel stories. And if you've been on the fence about doing it, just do it. You have permission. Be brave. Be bold. Send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, something big, something small, or something in between. It could even be an animal rebellion or an auntie rebellion or a grandma rebellion or, or a granddad rebellion for that matter. You can email your rebel story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. A huge thank you and welcome to Simone Kelly and Barbara Beck and Heather Button. Thank you for joining me on Patreon and don't forget to come and join us for the movie night. A big, humongous thank you to all of my existing patrons. Guys, seriously, I'm so grateful for the support and for the community and for the love and just for everything that you do uh, to create the community that we have. It is amazing and I am very, very grateful and for the support of the show as well. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as a bunch of bonus goodies then you can from as little as two dollars a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash sasha black that's enough waffling from me let's get on with the episode hello and welcome to the rebel author podcast today i'm joined by usa today best-selling author arsa maria bradley Asa grew up in Sweden, surrounded by archaeology and history steeped in Norse mythology, which inspired her sexy, paranormal romance and sizzling urban fantasy series. Asa came to the United States as a high school exchange student and quickly fell in love with ranch dressing and crime TV dramas of all flavours. Two addictions she unfortunately still struggles with. Currently, she lives on a lake deep in the forest of the Pacific Northwest with a British husband and a rescue dog of an indeterminate breed. Sadly, neither obeys her commands. <laughs> and that last line was my favourite of the whole... Oh, bio, I love that so much. <laughs> I, Hello, try, I try to train him. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm like long time listener, first time caller. Say on, the, on the old radio shows. Well, I'm glad to have you here. Would you like to tell everyone a little bit more about your writing journey specifically and kind of how you got to where you are today? Uh, yeah, I've um, so my background is actually in sciences. Um, my background is in medical physics and um I have always been sort of writing on the side. Um, Medical I, uh, physics. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. What, what is that? <laughs> so it's um, it's it's very applied physics um, that has to do with, uh, and it's a little bit different in Europe than what it is here in the states. Um, but in the states, uh, what. Uh, medical physics work on is either you go into either therapy or diagnostic um, and my, I specialized in therapy but um, a hospital has a medical physicist on on staff um, for like any imaging technology so they they are the people that make sure that the imaging technology is uh, up to par basically and that produces that the images that it's supposed to do if you're in diagnostic um, and in therapy the medical physicist um, is in charge of um, uh, some of the treatment planning for like radiation therapy. Um, they help the dosimetrists with uh, planning. Like the doctor will say, I need to deliver this much dose to the tumor, but all these organs around cannot have um, above a certain dose. And, and radiation doesn't behave linearly. Like it deposits at different depths, at different strengths, and then kind of sometimes like percolates for a while for a little bit or it can pass through tissue without damage it very much and then do a lot of damage at, at a particular depth so so then it's the physicist uh job to make sure that the science can perform what the what the doctor wants and then also to keep um the equipment up to par so that like when you dial the dials that's actually what's coming out um so uh yeah so that's what i that's what i uh started in um, high pressure and, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and I I always really liked languages and writing um uh, there's probably going to be a lot of 
drinking on this episode, Sasha, because I'm also a complete Becca fan who lots of strength. Oh, tell me, um, tell me your top ten. Uh, so I am number one restorative and number two learner, and then I have focus, futuristic, uh, intellection, uh, discipline, input, individualization. That's a hard one. Achiever and activator. Love so it. basically, I I absorb all the information. Um, I see all the problems with it. I overthink it. And then, and then you execute. Uh, no, I never execute because futuristic is like, we've already planned it. Okay. So it's already happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then activator and achiever gets focused, like in, involved in something that has nothing to do with this particular project that I'm supposed to be working on and then hyper-focus on that instead. So, oh, that's hilarious. But, yeah. But yeah, the learner, um, the, my learner is very um, dominant. And so... Uh, so basically, if I could be a professional student, I would probably be a professional student. So um, so I went into science, as I think my parents probably kind of stared me that way. But I was actually also very interested in the humanities um, and in languages. Um, and so later on, um, I went back and um, did an MFA in creative writing. Um, and part of that was because by then I had started working for a, a state school uh, in um, Washington State, where I live now, um, and teach. I teach here. So if you teach for a, a state school, you can take classes for free at other state schools, which turned out not to be as good as it sounded um, mm -hmm. and didn't quite work out that way. But I got some of the classes for free. So then I I, I did an MFA. But anyway, so back to the also, I'm very <laughs> backstory is a problem for me. So. <laughs> But so I was always writing on the side and um, I I started working for, uh, when I was finished with school, I started working for a medical physics software company and and it was a startup. So I, I had all kinds of different uh, roles in there. And um, when I decided to leave that company, I had done a lot of traveling. Like my, my uh, position was like 60% travel. So I was always on the road. And so I sort of picked apart all the different things I had done for that startup in terms of project management and quality assurance and installation and training. And um, what I really enjoyed was the technical writing aspect. And so um, after that, I worked as a technical writer and a, um, a UI uh, tester for a whole bunch of different software companies um, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and then eventually I moved up here to teach. So I've always been writing either as a technical writer or I was doing a lot of travel writing, uh, a lot of blog writing on the side. And then um, after I had moved from my job up to Washington State, um, I decided to do NaNoWriMo, uh, I think the second year I was here maybe, um, and sort of met a whole bunch of other writers. And then um, I wrote a novel. I tried to publish this novel. Um, and uh, I went to a writing conference to pitch it because this is back in 2000 and I don't know, 2000 six, seven, something like that. Um, and so I was sort of looking at the traditional route uh, and um, went to a writing conference, a fiction writing conference and bumped into some people there that were like, oh, it sounds like you're writing romance. And I was like, no, I don't think I'm writing romance. And I went to, they were like, come to this panel, we'll prove it to you. Uh, and I went to a panel and like found my tribe. So, um, so yes, I was, I was writing romance, just not very well. And, um, and then I did the traditional querying, did all of that stuff. Um, it took me a long time. Uh, it took like seven years before I sold a novel. Uh, and then uh, I got a traditional contract, but by then I'd already gotten really interested in, in indie publishing. And I had friends that were doing very well in indie publishing. So even when I sold that first novel, uh, traditionally, um, I sold a series. Um, I knew that I was going to be a hybrid author. Um, and that's, um, that's what I've been um, sort of doing in the end, traditional. And you're still doing traditional? Um, well, yes, but uh, I had sort of some development happening this week. Um, so I, I had that first series of um, being from Sweden, I'm really into Norse mythology. So that paranormal romance series, um, The Viking Warriors, is uh, like immortal Vikings that come back to Earth uh, to protect humanity from Loki and his evil minions and then shenanigans happen and they fall in love and find their fated mates 
um, I just got the rights back to that series. I, I asked for them <clears throat> a few months ago and it happened much quicker than I thought. So, um, so that has been my traditional contract. And um, I, I guess I have some traditional contract uh, with some of the collaborations we're going to talk about um, with some s smaller publishers. So yes, I'm, I'm technically still hybrid, but the, the big series that I had with my with source books is is now mine. Um, oh, so that's exciting. The, yeah. Although yeah. the audiobook's still out there. I think that's a seven year terms or something. So that's gonna be a while before I get those back. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are here to talk about collaborations. So could you start by talking about what drove you to collaborate in the first place and why might listeners want to collaborate too? I'm always quite resistant to collaborations, So I'd love, love you to convince me. I have <laughs> done a couple, but yeah, convince me. Yeah. I, um, you know, I didn't set out to do as many collaborations as I did. This happens a lot where I, I have like a really bad case of FOMO. So um, so if you invite me to something or if I see a submission call, uh, I'll be like, oh, that sounds amazing. Probably also like activator getting sidetracked. Like we should we should do that. Um, and so um, uh, I was coming out of a time where I, I had had um, really bad burnout and then the pandemic happened. And I, I also... Um, struggle with depression. So there, it's just a bad sort of combination of of things happening. And I was having a really hard time meeting my deadlines and staying on track and like executing my plans. Um, and I decided to um, to uh, do the, uh, the 1001 Dark Knight short story challenge. Uh, and I, I was like, well, this will this will help me, you know, getting something done. I can write a short story like that shouldn't be too hard. Um, is that the one where you write a short story in 24 hours? I'm no. Thinking, oh. uh, no, but that sounds fantastic. That would, <laughs> that would be cool. There is one out there. I can't remember. I think it's New York. <laughs> it's something to do with New York, but I swear that's what it was called. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not. I important. should, I, I'm going to have to Google that. Yeah. Um, no, this was um, 1000 and Dark Night is, um, uh, I'm trying to describe it. It's like this fantastic marketing conglomerate uh that is uh led by um liz berry and mj rose and um uh, jillian stein um and what they do it's almost like an author co-op where authors are are invited to write for 1001 dark nights um and usually they write novellas um that are sort of uh adjacent or in the same world uh, as what they write so th there's a lot of um the, they, it started out being a lot of romantic suspense and paranormal, but they also do like uh, sort of dangerous and dark romance. And so you have people like Larissa Ion, uh, Rebecca Zanetti, Sky War Warren are writing uh, for 1001 Dark Nights. Um, they have an incredible reader engagement and um, they often host uh, parties like they call them sparklers at different readers conferences with all the authors there. Um, and so they sent out a call for authors to submit to a short story anthology that they would then give as a bonus to um, all, all of their newsletter subscribers and uh, um, all of their readers, basically. So there was no monetary, um, there's no monetary attack, like there's no monetary sort of uh, profit attached to it, but it was um like I'm a huge fan of 1001 Dark Nights and the ladies that run it and so it was like validation um for me um to be a finalist and then uh, also great exposure in terms of uh getting that their whole marketing behind um that short story um so that's kind of what started in 2020 and then th these different projects kept on popping up and I noticed that um if I'm collaborating with other authors, I, I tended to make my deadlines. For some reason, um, when I hire an editor and I don't make the deadline, I I completely understand why I'm now dropped from the schedule and it's going to be a while before I came back on, on the schedule, but I'm fine with that. And then like maybe the book happens or maybe it never happens um, because that's just me being um, like having, uh, um, I, I'm trying to find 
uh, not accommodations, not accolades. Accountability. Accountability, yes. <laughs> Words are hard. Uh, so accountability to myself doesn't work very well. But for some reason, if there's a whole bunch of authors involved in a project, uh, I cannot mess up. Like, like I don't want to look, look bad in front of my peers, but also uh, I don't want to mess up and not be part of the project because that's what happens if you miss that deadline. So it, so it's a way for me to to keep accountability and, and keep writing. Um, so that's how, how I got um, involved in it. And so for, for me, uh, why I think you listeners might want to consider this is um, it's a huge validation if you're part of something, especially if you're part of something like a, an anthology where like maybe somebody that you're fangirling over is the big name that's in the anthology. So it's it's like validation that you were like one of the chosen ones to be part of the 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 uh, anthology or the collection, but it's also a way for new readers um, to find new readers because if they're fans of the other authors in the collection, the fact that you're part of it uh, gives you automatic like street creds or <laughs> automatic validation. So so exposure and validation is is one way. Um, also a lot of people join collaborations, uh, if they want to hit a list. Um, and so that's how, uh, I hit the USA today. Uh, one of the, uh, collaborations that came out earlier this year, um, hit the USA today. Um, uh, and then for, for me, it was really that reigniting the creative spark. That was what I really needed and, and sort of, um, enjoying, the supportive environment that that happened in the projects that I chose to to participate in. Um, Do you know yeah. which one of your strengths it is that um, likes the accountability? I'm just Probably, curious if you know. No, the lacks it. La no, that likes, likes it. Likes it. Likes or lacks because no. those, <laughs> those are both true. Yeah. Um, um, maybe. Well, discipline, I mean, discipline likes routine. Right. So that's probably one. And then um, I, 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 may, I think um, individualization likes it when I'm working with other people. Okay. Uh, and, and individualization likes it. Uh, like it used to get me in trouble all the time. And then Becca explained individualization. To, uh, like she she described it perfectly where how it fits with me, which is she talked about it as empathy but in an intellectual level um mm. and so and that is like i'm i'm an extroverted introvert so i love people but they drain me so i have mm -hmm. to go and be in like my cave um, and i am so interested in people i want to know everything about them but i do not want to be emotionally involved with them so so i'm always like i would get in trouble when i was younger because i would just be like asking all these really intense questions and then people would be like okay now we have an emotional bond like let's socialize and I, I need you for emotional support. And I was like, no, no, our time is over now. Like, <laughs> you've answered all the questions. I'm 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 fine just like learning all these things about you. My input and learner are very happy with all the information you're giving yeah. me. But no. Bye no. bye now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So, so like individualization as a uh as like in, uh, intellectual empathy. Um so yeah, and I the accountability I don't know maybe checklist for um achiever, achiever. Yeah, yeah I was just I was just curious okay so you've talked specifically about 1001 um and uh sort of novellas but I wondered like what are some of the because you've done a lot of different types of yeah. collaboration so I just wondered like if you could maybe share some of the different ways that you are seeing well one that you've collaborated in but also maybe some of the other cool things that you're seeing authors and all the different ways that you're seeing people collaborate at the moment yeah and I mean you can do collaborations from like I was doing creative collaborations in terms of actually creating products. Um, but you could look at collaboration also in terms of like marketing effort. So you could do anything from um, like newsletter swaps where uh, you have a list of people or you might uh, join uh, like a round robin uh, type of newsletter swap where you share news, like if you have a new release or if you have something on sale, you have these people that you know that write in the same genre uh, or people that you've joined through a group um, and um, and you share um, 
news like like you know that your readers would love a freebie from this other person in your genre uh and so you um collaborate with another writer to to do these newsletter swaps and they can be anything from like informal with people that you already know or or very organized things where um i'm part of a couple of round robins where uh we actually set it up where it's like here's my free book that i'm going to offer free uh for the whole year to this set of 11 other writers and so every month every person shares a free book um but uh, not everybody shares the same free book every month so your book gets shared once a month in somebody else's newsletter um and you share somebody else's book in your newsletter every month um so that works uh well uh, it works best if you're working with people in your genre so that's like marketing or just any kind of cross promotion in marketing. Um, in terms of collaborative uh, effort, um, you, you can do anything from like what I did was, uh, how I started was um, answering that submission call. Um, but then I also ended up uh, doing other things like, it's, it's funny, I think it, it's like a domino effect. Like you start one collaboration with other people like to collaborate. And then if you have people in there that are like, ideation they come up with really cool ideas and then off you go you know and then if you have FOMO you say yes to all of it so (laughs) I love ideation people I've got some amazing ideation people in my slack group and I'm just like they are the they are the best humans because you ask you 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 sort of drop a a breadcrumb and then all of a sudden it's like a a a proliferation of all these amazing ideas their brains are just amazing I just wish well I shouldn't say that I wish I had ideation but you know also like I definitely have FOMO for those people who have ideation I think it's an amazing skill I'm like yes let's do that that sounds amazing I would never have thought about that so um so uh so yeah so I I started with that uh short story and then um a friend of mine who writes uh, crime fiction, he has, he must, he, I don't know that he's taken the the uh, test, but he must have ideation because he comes up with really great ideas as well. So he, um, he writes for a small publisher um, uh, called, uh, oh, I keep on saying this wrong. So down and out. Yes. Um, and uh, they do mostly thrillers, crime fiction and uh, mysteries. And so he started writing um, like short, like short stories or novellas about the same grifter couple. So they're basically um, a couple that uh, that runs cons. And he invited all these other people to write in that same about that same couple, and they could write from the perspective of either the uh, one of the people in the couple or the person getting conned or somebody else. You just had to like sort of deal with like who these people were and their names are Rachel and Sam. Um, and then he sold, like the publisher set it up as um, episodic, like a TV series. Um, and so it's called The Grifter's Song. And I think they're in season four now. And um, uh, Frank Zafiro is the editor that came up with this idea. And he invited me to um, write for season two uh, because he, he sort of wanted, like he's a, you know, he's a, a white dude with, a background in law enforcement he was like this is going to be much more interesting if I invite people that are not just like my friends who are white dudes in law enforcement like, like background in law enforcement or military um so uh he's like I should invite Asa because she writes romance and so um so until I wrote that episode in season two I think they might have banged after this but that's definitely the first time Sam and Rachel banged on the page because that's what that happens not- when you invite a romance writer that's not what I was expecting you to say. I love that. That's made my life. So, um, so yeah, I would and- be a lot more interested now than after that point. <laughs> so, and now it's in Kindle Unlimited. They they just moved the whole series to Kindle Unlimited, so you can uh, you can if you're in Kindle Unlimited, you can binge the whole thing. Uh, and that was for the first time I wrote in somebody else's world. Um, and so that was like like triggered a whole other creative. Uh, spark and also because it was technically out of my genre that also uh, made it really interesting and then um, Frank is somebody that I I he's a friend and somebody that I I read his books I love his books and so uh, collaborating with him as an editor 
um, was really cool too, uh, being able to work with him. Um, so that's another way to collaborate. It's like you can write in somebody else's world. Like we used to have the Kindle worlds. They're, yeah. they're not around anymore, but there's a lot of people that have shared worlds that you could you could write in. Um, and then, um, you know, in terms of uh, collections or anthologies, either with brand new content, uh, which is what I did for the Midnight Magic collection that came out May this year. And that's the one that hit the list. Um, and then I also organized uh, a collection last December. I, I picked like people that I knew. So the, the short story for 1001 Nights actually ended up triggering a new series for me. Um, and so I ended up writing uh, a, like a Norse werewolf series. Um, and the short story is the prequel to that. And so then I was like, well, if I'm going to write a new series, I should like write an anthology with people that write uh, shifters that I like. So um, both that I like the people and I like their books. And so I invited some people and I was like, hey, do you guys want to do like a holiday novella collection with me? I have no idea what I'm doing, but this would be really great. Uh, and so uh, seven other writers said yes. And so uh, we came out with a, a collection right around Christmas that was all wolf shifters. Um, and that was interesting to learn then like how, how what does this look like when you're the person doing the project? It looks um, like a lot. <laughs> it does. Yeah. I was really happy. I picked people that was like, that were like patient and were like, you know, also that's a really pretty cover, but um, maybe <laughs> the sweater is a little too hallmark and we should go a little bit more paranormal. I was uh -huh. like, oh yeah, like back to cover I did. So um, yeah, that was, that was really eye opening, And also, uh, but because I'm a learner and input, right. So at this point, the Midnight Magic, although it wasn't coming out until May uh, 2022 this year, it started way before that. The project started way before that. So the stuff that I was learning from Gina Kincaid, who is like this amazing organizer, taskmaster, um, I was the stuff that I was learning from her, I was just like blatantly stealing and applying to my own project. Um, and so that was really good. It was almost like I was taking a master class and then like also doing like the class project uh, assignment by doing the the shifters and mistletoe uh, project. So that was cool. Um, but you can do those collections like uh, so that was new content. Um, so you can join and, you know, join a collection, write new content for that collection. I would recommend if you're doing that, that you write um, something that's an entry point into uh, an already existing series or or uh do it as like a launch for a new series if you want to um but then you can also do collections where you are using old content so uh, some of the other things i've been involved with is um uh like gina is now putting together a collection of uh people's um um perma freebies so basically this will be, you don't have to create any new content, but you get uh, cross promotion with other authors as they're promoting the collection. Um, and then um, I was in a collection with um, Delta James, but I think this was because we were hired, we were working with the same uh, promotions company and that promotions company came up with, uh, Delta was coming out with a new series. Um, and so she wrote a prequel novella for that series. And the way that they packaged that prequel novella was by inviting authors that had series in the same genre. Um, and then we put in full length free books into the collection. So you got like brand new content from Delta James and then I think four free first in series books in the same genre. Um, and so again, that didn't uh, that didn't give uh, any monetary compensation. But in terms of my newsletter subscribers, because in order to get the book, people had to sign up for a newsletter. Uh, in terms of newsletter subscribers, uh, my newsletter subscribers like skyrocketed, and the open rate and click rate uh, of the people that signed up is are high. So so that's another way. I mean, you can just think of a whole bunch of different ways of either taking old content and repackaging it to get more exposure or write new content um, to be part of something that will be 
whatever the the goal of the collection is yeah I'm seeing a lot of authors uh like collaborate under a theme so like if it was werewolves it would be uh, like like enemies to lovers werewolves a fake dating werewolves a you know a woman in jeopardy werewolves you know and they're all they all have the same kind of cover branding but each book is a different book and then often those books lead into like whatever series so I'm seeing like a lot of authors starting to collaborate in that way and then the series obviously they only get their individual book income but each book by default promotes the other book in the series right so you're hoping to to get some sell through yeah yeah I mean I don't I haven't done one but I have seen other authors doing that quite a lot at the moment and and I'm not into samplers like as a reader I I I don't like samplers because I'm like oh I'm gonna get hooked and I'll have to buy all the books and I can't afford it um but I know people that are doing like sampler collections uh, are doing really well and you can do those through um book funnel like you can set up uh you know, a book funnel sales page or a book funnel, like newsletters sign up and just set it up to where it's like all these people are, just have samplers uh, from like the first in series or uh, in the same genre. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I don't think uh, either of us can pretend that, you know, the fact that collaborate collaborations take an awful amount of time to set up, to run properly, to market, to like all the logistics and the organization. And a lot of collaborations earn very well at launch, but then don't earn huge amounts of money sort of afterwards. So what do you right. feel are some of the best benefits you've seen from collaborating? You just mentioned there about the newsletter uh, sign up. So yeah, what have been some of the best benefits for you? Well, other than the fact that it, it got me like writing again and get excited about projects, um, I, I think it's really important that when you go into collaboration that y- you you sit down and you sort of articulate what are my expectations from this project? Um, am I expecting to make a lot of money? Am I expecting to hit a list? Um, and that your expectations um, align with what the the project goal is of, of the collaboration. So so then that speaks to itself that if you're joining a collaboration, um, you should ask what, what is the goal of this collaboration and like what are we hoping that the outcome is going to be? And if if that is not stated or or um or formed yet, you you probably want to maybe not join that collaboration or or work with the people that are organizing it to come up with what that's going to be because there has to be some sort of goal that everybody's working towards, um, and um, so but so again number two learner so I will find uh, if you teach me something new in any project I will be happy no matter how little money we made or whether we don't hit the list or whatever. So so some of the, for me personally, some of the things that is the great benefits other than what we already talked about in terms of validation and um, networking and um, uh, some, some uh, you know, higher exposure, um, hopefully leading to profits down the road is that I learned so much from other people about marketing, like the ideation people coming up with crazy ideas that I would never have thought about myself. But also in terms of like, um, I'm not uh, really on TikTok. So watching like the, I'm going to use the Midnight Magic uh, collection that was a a bunch of paranormal um, novellas uh, and they were paranormal and urban fantasy novellas. Um, That group, um, we, when you signed up, it was understood that like, this is a a very low cost collaboration. So we each paid in some money for marketing and production cost. Um, but then it was basically, okay, now you have to work your ass off in order for this to, to work. And so each person had a task that spoke towards their strengths. So there were people writing at like writing social media copy. So for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, um, there were people doing TikTok videos. Um, there were people doing the graphics. There were people coming up with social media game. There were people um, uh, like uh, hosting reader parties in different reader groups. And so you're basically sharing the work. And so some of the stuff that maybe you haven't done or are not comfortable doing, um, you can learn from other people that are like, that's their strength doing it. So one of the things that, um, that I am, um, 
uh, not very comfortable with. Like I don't have um, a reader group. I've I've um, I've I belonged to some multi-author reader groups. I'm just really bad at uh, because I work a full-time job uh, and write. I'm just really bad at like having to be in a, a social media setting and just interacting with readers. Um, and I now realize from looking at what some of the other people in the collaborations did that the reason why I didn't like it was because I was really bad at it. So I wasn't like the readers weren't enjoying it. I wasn't enjoying it because I wasn't really great at uh, creating uh, engaging content. And so that was some of the stuff that I learned from uh, from the people that were like, I love social media games and I have all these social media games like graphics that I set up and here's what you need to know in terms of if you want to get a, a lot of engagement, like don't make it complicated. Don't do this. Don't do that. And like, just make it so that they can just answer with an emoji. Like if you can make it so that they answer with an emoji, you will get like five times as many engagements as you do normally. Um, and then also things in terms of like, uh, there are all these like, reader groups out there or like self-promotion groups on Facebook where authors promote themselves. And it seems like we're just promoting ourselves to other authors. Um, and so the, the secret to that was, you know, if you have a social media game with that, maybe it doesn't have anything to do. You have a social media game, but it doesn't say buy my book, buy my book. Um, it's just a social media game that maybe has the cover of your book on the graphics the more people that engage with that post, the more exposure it's going to get to other people on that social media platform. So it's fun um, because you're doing a fun game, but also you're getting marketing for free uh, just by being clever in the way that you apply the graphics. And so those are some of the things that I learned. I mean, it seems really obvious now when I'm saying it, right? But but seeing examples of like a person, somebody that's already tested and knows like, okay, I've been testing this for like a year and here are the five graphics that perform really well. So do iterations of graphics like this for the collection. And then you take that with you and do that for your own work later on. Um, those kind of things are, are stuff that you learn. I, I felt like it was like a masterclass of uh, learning stuff from people that had uh, uh, strong skills in areas that I w w was not strong in. Uh, and it's also a way to dip your toe into things like, the TikTok things, like I'm just dipping my toe in that. And I am now in a completely different collaboration, which you know a lot about Patreon, but uh, I don't. <laughs> and so um, uh, I, and I don't have my own Patreon, but I'm now part of the um, Happily Ever After Collective, which is run by Avery Flynn. And so she must be ideation too. Her and definitely activator. She <laughs> So her... Um, so this project is kind of based on, if you think of like Harlequin subscriptions where people like get the four, same four books, uh, not same four books, they get four books every month in the same genre that follow kind of the same beats or the same uh, uh, turning points. So what Avery did was she, uh, we're writing uh, four authors every month are writing um, four novellas around the same trope but we're all in different genres and we all write different uh, in terms of like uh, um, some people write straight, some people write square. Uh, we have um, diverse authors, diverse voices. Um, there is different heat levels, but it's all around the same trope. And so the Patreons that subscribe to the ATA collective um, will basically get their favorite catnip trope but see it applied in four different ways um so that's another like cool way of taking something and then uh changing it so that gives me an exposure to patreon that i uh that i wouldn't have gotten if i was just like tootling with it myself basically so that's kind of cool too that is cool i've never yeah. heard of a collective like that that's wicked yeah although the yeah, pressure to write a novella every month seems like a lot. No, no, no. I write like every author writes one novella. There's enough um, authors to, uh, so there's whatever four times 12 is. I think some people are, had to write twice because we had some people that had to uh, pull out. But yeah, you write, you're responsible for one novella for the trope that you're writing for. Uh, but the but the subscribers gets four exclusive novellas that are not available anywhere else uh, cool. around that trope. Yeah.
I like that a yeah. lot. Okay, so you've talked about a lot of the positives, but yes. I can imagine, perhaps from a selfish perspective, <laughs> that, when, that when you're managing a group of like 20 plus authors in big, gigantic multi-box sets, or just any number of authors more than yourself there can be challenges I mean I this is why Sasha doesn't play because she doesn't play well she <laughs> likes to be in charge hello come on um but can you talk about some of the challenges uh you know I'm sure you're, there are different challenges than what I am imagining but yeah talk about some of the challenges of working in big author groups yeah it, there, there are many uh, first of all like we're authors right so it's like we're the worst. I mean, it's like herding cats, like trying to get people to like, you know, oh, like I just woke up from my story and I have no idea what's on my calendar or that I had a due date. <laughs> um, so so we've already talked about like making sure that you know what your expectations are going into the to, to the project and then um, uh, making sure that that aligns with uh, the goals of the project. Um, so you depending on like you should choose a project that works for you. And and luckily there are so many different projects and collaborations models out there that that really works. Like, um, uh, so I hated group work, uh, like in school, but also in a professional setting, because there's always like that one person that does all the work and then the whole group gets like the, <laughs> gets the credit. Um, and so one of the reasons why I liked uh, Gina Kincaid, uh, who, it, it was the organizer of, of Midnight Magic. And also why I like um, uh, uh, Avery Flynn is because they're really great organizers, but they're also really good taskmasters. So so that like student that was like the group project person that did all the work, I really like it when the organizer says like, hey, you promised to do this. Uh, you're not executing, like do it or you, you can't be part of the collection. I mean, you, and you can say that you can, you can state that in many like nice diplomatic ways. Um, and um, uh, for yeah, me, she, that's my problem. I'm not very good at stating it. I'm like, oi, you get the fuck on with it. And, that's, <laughs> Apparently and that I like that. Well. <laughs> and I love that. Like, I, I am totally okay with that. Like, uh, like with the Midnight Magic collection, there was one task that we were all responsible for and that was to post in these like once a week to post in these Facebook groups that I felt was a waste of time and so I would always kind of like procrastinate and not really do it uh and then um Gina who is uh I mean she's diplomatic but she's very direct she would just like there was a spreadsheet that we were like basically a google sheet that we were reporting in you know like the, I, which day you posted and uh you know when you did it and so she would check it and she would go like just highlight all the groups in red that weren't staying on task and so you would just see like you would go in whenever you were going oh and she posted in the group too like yo you're not doing your stuff oh um God. which I loved because I need that kick in the ass as well um but for for some for some people it was too much it was like uh no I'm feeling attacked and like I'm I can't handle this um, but, but I like it. I'm like, yeah, I was totally not pulling my weight. And now my, my name is not just my name, like the entire cell and that spreadsheet is now shameful red. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so those are some of the things uh, like if you check, check to see who the leader is and what, what their organizational skills are, uh, before also I'm number one restorative. So I see problems everywhere. Um, nice thing about restorative is if it's in the balcony, they usually see solutions as well. Oh. Um, but one thing you have to let go of is that if if you're not the person running the show, you know that the no, organizer- No, I'm already is- out. I'm already out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like you can come with suggestions, but then be willing to do the work for those suggestions. If that makes sense. Like you don't want to yeah. be the person that's like, you know- you're not doing this right. You're not doing this right. You're not doing this right. You want to be the person that's like, hey, we could also do this and then be prepared for, okay, that's great. That's a great idea. Like you go do it uh, or find these people and you go do it. So you have to get, you have to sort of um, be willing to get rid of some of that. And that comes with expectations, right? If you, if you're like, oh, I, we're all going to make like a hundred thousand dollars, then the stakes are much higher. Um, but if you're like, I'm, I'm interested in what I can learn from this project, and I would really like to hit a list, um, then 
you might not be as like stressed or anxious about people not doing things the way that you would do them. Uh, but I think that the the cool thing about the task um, dispersion or or um, delegation that means that you you are responsible for one area, right? And that hopefully that's an area that plays to your strengths. And then you just have to trust that the people that are in charge of the other stuff that that plays to their strengths, um, uh, because you can't do it all. Like like we already know, like it's already just hard enough to be on all the social media platforms and write all the books and do all the marketing and run all the ads and like so uh, so some of that it's like you you kind of have to feel more like oh like I don't have to worry about that because there's somebody else that takes care of it. But it is hard. Like if you're somebody that's used to being in charge, um, know that you can control your content and your oh, I'm your, laughing because your area <laughs> I'm laughing because my, because I don't know if you've ever had coaching from Ellie um but Ellie yeah. basically had me doing this 30 day bloody I love her but I had to do this 30 day bit of homework around control and the fact that like <laughs> I cannot control everyone and everything. Um, <laughs> and the fact that you just <laughs> looped it around to control. And I was just like, oh, yes. And herein lies the reason I don't like collaborating <laughs> because I cannot control everything. <laughs> oh, that just made me proper cackle. Oh, my you just goodness. Have to find, you just have to find the... Uh, like maybe you need to be the organizer of the collaboration slash I, I, I do not want to do any more <laughs> collaborating on organizing I love Ellie because I think Ellie is high input so yeah. uh, so she presents a lot of things to me in spreadsheets and I'm like yes <laughs> <laughs> with many different resources I'm like yeah. yes I love it yeah yeah no I think yeah but that's part of um I I mean part of the if you choose a project where you where the where the person that's organizing the project is successful in an area that you want to be successful in mm. then then learning from how they're doing it is easier than yes. if you're picking a project where uh i mean i like being the the small uh small fish in the big pond part of the collaboration where the people that are in the collaboration are bigger names than me because I, I'm I'm usually there to learn that's like my my main expectation is to pick up new skills um, okay so yeah. speaking of new skills uh one of your collaborations hit the USA Today list so can yes. you talk about some of the successful marketing tactics that you guys used in order to hit the list um yes we had uh it it was um uh, we had a six months, maybe even seven or eight months, because we had like sort of a soft um, uh, start to it. But we hit um, pre-orders hard. Like we were promoing pre-orders um, every week. Everybody had a task um, for that collection. Um, and we, we pre-ordered it at 99 cents and then it went full price uh, on launch day or maybe a week after launch day. Um, and so, and that, that was um, where I was um, listening to people that had done this before, um, except for the not posting in the Facebook groups when I was supposed to and getting highlighted in red. Um, so pre-orders hitting all the different social media um, platforms. Uh, there were 20 plus authors in that collection. So you had 20 people promoing that book uh, every single week. Um, lots of um, reader groups uh, and that we we were guests in each other's readers groups, but then also going out and finding uh, influencers and other reader groups that are not necessarily author reader groups, but just reader groups that were really into urban fantasy, that were really into um, paranormal romance, uh, and then hitting them hard and asking to be part of like takeovers in those groups. Um, so we were basically 20 plus authors hustling hard for, for six months leading up to it. So think of it as like um, doing a launch, like a hard launch for one of the books in your series. And then having like 20 plus of your friends also doing all of that for six months. So, so that's what we did. We, we, <laughs> We were really worried because we weren't 
seeing pre-orders at like the level where we thought we were we could guarantee that we would hit the list or it was most likely that we would hit the list and then we had an amazon glitch where the book just disappeared for 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 four days it was like all the other vendors had the pre-orders up but it, it just disappeared completely and we thought we had lost like thousands and thousands of pre-orders um it reappeared again um because i think gina at some point was like emailing uh different email addresses that might go to jeff bezos like directly but just trying different combinations but um but but we did like for we, we probably lost five days of pre-orders about a month before the release which was a really bad time to lose it so that was a little bit of panic right there but um but yeah hustling and uh doing all the work we didn't use any uh i i don't I think we ran we ran a few ads, but not very many. It was all people Hustle. hustling, yeah. And that's incredible. Yeah. So that was amazing. And then um um one of the things that we did with and I didn't know that this was a thing, so this is a, a new thing that I learned, but for the collection that I organized, um the, all the different uh authors that were writing um shifter romance uh all of us are on uh, bookbub uh, and have um, enough followers on bookbub where we can do the um new release alerts um and i didn't i didn't know this but if you have if you're if you're putting up a collection in its brand new content um and each person on bookbub claims the collection as their book then when you do the new release alerts that you have to pay for, but it's like, I think you can only send it to people that are following you that are in the U S and it's like 20 cents or something per reader. Um, well, BookBub actually goes, it will take uh, all the followers of all the authors in the collection uh, and, and eliminate duplicates. And so when you sign up for the, uh, new release alert uh, it will go to everybody's followers that are in the collection and and no duplicates um, so that's one way uh, but it, it only you can only do the new alerts if it's brand new content um, so that's one way that you can uh, really use um, you know something that's already there that you probably use for your own books but now you're getting much more exposure um, other than just newsletter and stuff and yes it, it costs more because you have more readers but you're sharing the cost among more, uh, more authors. Um, so that was one thing we did. We already talked about the, the Facebook games uh, about uh, like learning. Uh, and you can do these games on more than just Facebook. Um, we did a lot of uh, giveaways, um, like with more authors um, uh, pinching in. You can uh, offer bigger prices. So. And it doesn't even have to be bigger prices in terms of cost. But if you're thinking about it like, hey, I'm, I'm doing a giveaway for you can get a signed print book uh, of my series. Now think of it in terms of like, hey, we're doing a giveaway and you can get 20 signed books from 20 different authors. So we called it like a basket of print books. Uh, and uh, uh, like each author can send the book uh, you know, sign it and send it to the person that wins the giveaway. So all the stuff that you're doing for your own launch, now it just becomes bigger uh, in terms of what you can offer as a price, uh, but also bigger in terms of like how much it's shared. Um, so not just in terms of marketing efforts, in terms of posting in newsletters, you can also think about it in terms of prices are bigger, exposure is bigger. Um, so yeah. It's, yeah, uh, that's that's that really works. cool. I didn't really think about that in terms of like making the prizes bigger, but that's a really good point. Yeah. Okay. My last question before I ask the ultimate podcast question: How can writers keep marketing their collaborative projects after they've launched? Um. So yeah, so this ties into also making sure that uh, there's a contract in place. Like you, you, even if you're collaborating with your best friend that you have known since first grade. Um, or even before first grade, like, or your twin, even <laughs> whoever you're collaborating with, um, you should always have a contract in place. And depending on, you know, how close you are to your collaborator, 
uh, it could be a formal agreement that's been vetted by a lawyer, or it can just be you're jotting something down on a napkin. But there needs to something be something in place that says, okay, this is this is what you are signing up to do. This is what uh, the mission of the project is, and and this is when you get your rights back. Um, which that is the important thing is like when do you get your rights back? Um, and so um, the tail end of a collaboration especially if you're doing something like where you're doing pre-orders for six months. I mean, after those six months and then release happens, everybody's like moving on to other project and they're done with that. Um, so you can do things like um, with the anthology that um, that I organized, we did, we were putting in for a book bub like every month trying to get one. The, the collection was up for three months and then all the rights reverted back to the authors. Um, and we got a book bub for the last month that the collection was up. So that was kind of cool to go out with a bang. Then life happened. Uh, in this case, life was named Google and Amazon price match and everything got messed up. Mm. But, uh, but that those are other things that happens. Um, and then um, Zoe York, who I know you also like, who's like um, one of my gurus and also um, uh, like, I'm honored to call her a friend. Um, she has this cross promotion thing once a quarter, which is basically like a book bub, but it's, um, it was called like romance cross promotion, but we renamed it to Zoe bub at some point and just made her change the, the name as well. So once a quarter, uh, uh, like 500 plus, I think last time we were 700 authors, um, uh, uh have a permanent free or put one of their books for free across all vendors or just on Amazon if you're in KU. Um, and then one day only, everybody shares that link uh, to the website where you can download all the free books uh, on all their social media and in their newsletter. And uh, the downloads are like phenomenal that day. It only works for free, but I get downloads that are up with what I get for a book bub and it's, it doesn't cost me any money. So there was a Zoe Bob. I don't even think I know 700 authors. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know all the people. They're just in this group and they just like people sign up for it and do it. And she's actually branching out to, I think last time we also had Cozy Mystery and there is also YA. So if if anybody's writing in romance or in YA or in mystery, you might want to check out um, Zoe Bub or ask any of your friends if they are uh, in the Zoe Bub group uh, and then um, invite you and then you have to answer some questions and then Zoe will uh, let you in whenever she's there next time accepting new people. Um, so that went out with a bang. So the, that was really, remember I told you about bad at backstory. The, uh, going back to your question, <laughs> <laughs> the point of that was um, when the right before the collection is about to come down, because most of the collections do come down at some point, if you're doing collaboration with collections, uh, do some big promo before you go out. But then um, when you get your rights back, um, do something new to the um, to the work. So, for example, I wrote novellas that are in the series that I write the the Norse werewolves or the Norse wolf shifters. Uh, they were exclusive to the collection. There were new content exclusive to the collections um, when the collections came out. And I timed it so that um, I can now expand those novellas into full-length books and and put in uh, more stuff, like more characters, and expand it so that they now fit in a particular slot. <laughs> that is a the... big dog. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's kind of medium-sized. He's like... He looks bigger than a than a like a la, like a Labrador or something. No? Yeah, he's just really like stocky. He's got <laughs> staffy in him, so he's very ah uh, like, yes, okay. Yeah. So my dad has always had Staffordshire Bull Terriers. So for listeners, a great big beautiful dog just walked through the background of the video, <laughs> and I was like, oh, pretty dog. Um, uh, yeah, my dad's always had Staffordshire Bull Terriers, and and them things, man. They even though they're short. They are like just slabs of meat held yeah. together with bones. Like, and they're like they're like bulldozers or tanks. Like yeah, literally. like his his uh his method of like things not working the way that they should be doing is just like apply more force. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, 
<laughs> that is the most stuffy thing ever. <laughs> Literally ever. One of my favorite stories. And I think I've already told it on the podcast, so I'm not gonna tell it again. But one of my favorite stories is is like is a staffy story where the dog just doesn't know how to give up. And uh honestly, I think staffies, like the breed, if the breed had Clifton strengths, they would be number one competition, <laughs> followed by number two focus because nothing else exists other than whatever it is that they won. <laughs> yes. Yes. And like I don't know if like which one is like tenacity and determination maybe like discipline but like all the videos of the dog that's like hanging by its jaws from yes. a tire or a, yes. or a, yeah. or a piece of rope yeah. in a tree that's usually yeah. a, like a staffy mix yeah. of some sort yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's okay. that's right yeah, yeah. So, so when you get your work back do something new to it um so that it's different and then like relaunch it fit it into a series that you already have or uh maybe bundle it with something else like you can you can always use it as a newsletter magnet or bonus content or patreon content um because uh, if it was part of something that was exclusive before um it's it's kind of new content um but you might have to tweak it a little bit yeah okay well this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Oh, this one is hard. I was, I've been like thinking about this ever <laughs> since you said, and since I got your email uh, saying like, yes, we're going to talk. Um, so I was going to do something that like made me look really cool in terms of uh, like a, uh, a few years ago, my husband and I like quit, we quit our jobs and took a year off and went traveling um, and then like that travel uh, through like India, Australia and Southeast Asia, like made me come back and change my career into teaching instead. Um, but uh, since this is mostly um, uh, writers that listen to podcasts, I, 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 I think I'm going to do like, like a quiet rebel moment, which is that um, after like part of this working with all these collaborations and kind of uh, not having a way of really focusing on a strategy because there was so much stuff happening in my life in terms of uh, stress and upheaval. And I, I just couldn't concentrate and I kept on blowing deadlines. Um, what I decided to do as a writer is to hit the reset button, uh, which is really scary. So I have actually not had any new rela releases other than novellas that have been part of collaborations um for uh a year and a half uh which is a really scary place to be as an indie writer uh, but I made myself be okay with that um and then I also hit the reset button in terms of engagements of appearances and I said no I'm going to take like a year to just get things in order and relaunch things and uh and this is where I'm going this is the rebel moment um uh, if you've listened to uh, this podcast before, then people people know about Zoe York's and Series 2.0. Uh, and the Series 2.0 is like the next series is your Series 2.0. But remember, I'm number one restorative, so I have to fix all the problems. So the rebel moment is that my Series 2.0, it, it, it's not going to be like a new series. It's actually me going back and redoing the series that kind of half-assed launched the way that I wanted to do it. Uh, and so is like, no, no, don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. But I'm still going to do it that way against advice. That's my rebel moment is restorative. It was getting going back and fixing one book and then fixing the novellas into what they should have been. Um, uh, but it's scary. It's scary to say, I'm not going to have any income for a while. I'm going to hit reset and, and just, find the joy again in in writing and launching and i am sure you are going to generate a metric fuckload of restorative energy pennies by fixing all of the things so, i am having yeah. so much fun which yeah, is like it exactly. sounds ridiculous to other people but i am like i'm fixing all the problems yeah and it's just so good like i'm sleeping so much better <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and this is the thing right we have to lean into like ourselves and this is why it doesn't matter what advice you hear online it doesn't matter what i say on the podcast it doesn't matter like who you're listening to at the end of the day the only person that actually knows how the actions you are taking are impacting you and your personal energy levels and your personal happiness and mental health 
is you. So like, right. fuck what anybody else said. Like, not fuck Zoe, because I actually love Zoe. And she was just <laughs> a delight to speak to. But also like, fuck anybody else's advice, right? Only you know how it affects you and how those things are impacting you. And if you are generating like a shit ton of joy, like I literally saw your face light up when you told me, <laughs> like the, the excitement, the happiness. The exactly. Like, yeah. then that is what you should be doing because hello, we did not like go into a creative writing career to make it another day job right the whole point right. is that it's fun and enjoyable and that it gives us like joy and energy so yeah I love it I love it okay yeah. well would you like to tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your books and anything else that you would like to add um yeah I am at uh asa maria bradley.com uh it's my website and you can find all the social media there um I'm I'm on Twitter Instagram and Facebook I'm not very active on Twitter um and uh facebook uh, uh so so on my author page um uh, I'm, I'm again reset button so i'm 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 taking a step back but you can always um email me f- through my website um and uh if you want to see more pictures of the dog he he kind of dominates my instagram feed so um that's where rescue ryan shows up but awesomemariabradley.com is where you can find all the links Excellent. And I will put everything um, in the show notes as well. I'll put all those things there. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. You are most great. I'm a huge fangirl. Yeah. (laughs) And thank you to all of the show's listeners. And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as a bunch of goodies, then you can by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Arthur Maria Bradley, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next time, I'm going to be joined by Kim Taylor Blakemore, and we're going to be talking all about how to write historical fiction. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.